Good morning. Love the energy, love the conversation. This is so terrific to have you all here today to uh, join us in the Perry Lecture and Celebration. And thank you all for being here. Um, this is one of the uh, longest ongoing lectures that we have in our School of Public Health and Health Professions. And uh, as most of you know, I'm Jean Wiktowski wendy and I'm Dean of the School of Public Health and Health Professions. Now, our school um, lecture, see, lecture actually is in honor of J. Warren Perry. And he was the first dean of our School of Health-Related Professions. He was a pioneer in the field of allied health, and he served as dean from 1966 to his retirement in 1977. Uh, in 1989, Alan Stull, who uh, was a, a friend and colleague of J. Warren Perry established this lecture series. So this has been going on for uh, 20 or more years, actually 30 years. Uh, in January of 19, uh, or 2003, our School of Health-Related Professions merged with then Department of Social and Preventive Medicine to form a School of Public Health and Health Professions, and we received uh, accreditation, full accreditation in 2009, and reaccreditation most recently in 2015. The schools expanded as a result, so we have departments of rehabilitation science, exercise nutrition science, but also uh, now epidemiology, environmental health, community health, health behavior, and uh, biostatistics. We are accredited by CEIF, the Council of Education in Public Health, for our school. We're one of uh, just over 60 total accredited schools across uh, the United States and Canada, and actually expanding around the world. We also are accredited in many other areas, dietetics, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and we're uh, now with our new department, or our new program in athletic training, we'll be seeking accreditation there. Um, and our school is unique because we are one of a few schools within um, the uh, uh, American uh, schools of public uh, programs and schools of public health that include both the health professions and public health. So we look at this as a, a unique experience that allows our students to interact. Um, and uh, it's been a wonderful experience to be dean of this great school. So at the beginning of the Perry Lecture, we honor our Outstanding Teacher of the Year. And the Outstanding Teacher is presented to a faculty member whose recent teaching performance initiatives, publications, presentations demonstrate outstanding contributions to education within the School of Public Health and Health Professions. Uh, the Teachers of the Year are nominated from among our faculty. And this year, it is my great pleasure to present the 2018 Teacher of the Year Award to Dr. Sarah Mona Prisbilla. Come on down. So stay here. <laughs> So Dr. Prisbilla is an assistant professor in our Department of Community Health and Health Behavior. She's been teaching in SPHHP since the spring of 2014 when she came on as a research pro assistant professor and then moved into a tenure line. She has taught both in our graduate and undergraduate programs. In our graduate program, she created and taught CHB 524, Understanding and Reducing Sexual Risk Behaviors. She's also taught CHB 523, Introduction to Program Planning and Evaluation, and CHB 650, Applied Regression in Public Health. 
Dr. Prisbilla created and taught our first offering of Pub 101, Introduction to Public Health, and that class, uh, which was one of our first in the undergraduate curriculum, was wildly successful. Nearly 300 students registered for that class in her first author offering, and it has remained one of the most sought after popular courses on UB's campus. Mona has also taught Pub 220, Social and Behavioral Influences on Health in our newly created undergraduate public health program. Her nominator wrote, Sarah Mona has been successful at inspiring, motivating, and entertaining undergraduates in large class settings. She has demonstrated superior teaching skills and has received high teaching evaluations from both undergraduate and graduate students in her classes. Based on the comments, many students indicated that they were inspired and enthusiastic about public health. Besides instructor scores, course evaluation, and positive student comments, three additional areas stand out. Her use of multiple forms of instruction in classes ranging from the graduate to undergraduate level, her accessibility to students to help them understand the material which was reflected in their evaluations, and her dedication and continued effort to improve her teaching is exemplified by her excellence in course instruction through Inquiry Excite Grant. Dr. Prisbilla has taken on the role of the undergraduate program director for our school. In that role, she is extremely innovative and very dedicated to making our UB program among the best in the nation. She has done all of this while maintaining an active research portfolio. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Prisbill. <laughs> She's crying. <laughs> so at this time, I'd like to introduce today's Perry lecturer, Dr. Jeffrey Fong. Dr. Fong is a professor in the Department of, of Psychology at the University of Waterloo, one of the most esteemed departments of psychology in Canada. He also serves as senior investigator at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Dr. Fong received his BA in psychology from Stanford University and his PhD in social, social psychology from the University of Michigan. Prior to Waterloo, he held faculty positions at Northwestern University in Princeton. Dr. Fong is a highly productive researcher who has produced over 300 scientific publications. Based on his research and professional accomplishments, Dr. Fong has received a number of national and international awards. Some highlights include, in 2007, he became the first researcher to receive a Senior Investigator Award from the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. In 2013, he received the World Health Organization World No Tobacco Day Award. In 2015, he received the American Cancer Society's Luther L. Terry Award for Outstanding Research Contribution, a global award given every three years. Also in 2015, Dr. Fong was elected a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. In 2017, Dr. Fong was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Dr. Fong is the founder and chief principal investigator of the International Tobacco Control Policy Evaluation Project, the ITC project, which is the first ever international cohort of tobacco use. The mission of the ITC project is to conduct rigorous evaluation of the psychological and behavioral effects of national level tobacco control policies of the World Health Organization's framework convention on tobacco control. 
the first ever international treaty on health. ITC researchers conduct population cohort surveys, experimental studies, and tobacco product and biomarker studies across numerous countries. The ITC project has grown to be a global research program of over 150 researchers across 29 countries. The ITC researchers conduct large-scale annual prospective cohort surveys of tobacco use to evaluate tobacco control policies in countries inhabited by over 50% of the world's population, 60% of the world's smokers, and 70% of the world's tobacco users. Findings from ITC have contributed to the formation and implementation of strong evidence-based tobacco control policies throughout the world. Data from the ITC will be presented in today's Perry Lecture, which is entitled, The Use of Scientific Evidence in the Fight Against Global Tobacco Epidemic, Examples from the International Tobacco Control Policy Evaluation Project. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fong, our distinguished Perry Lecture. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Jean, and it's wonderful to be here in Buffalo to uh, reconnect with uh, old friends and uh, ITC colleagues over here, and also to meet all of you, although I can't meet all of you, but it's nice. It's, uh, thank you so much for coming, and it's wonderful to have this opportunity um, with respect to the J. Warren Perry Distinguished Lecture. I'm honored and thrilled to be here today. Um, I'm sorry, I, can't, I have to stay here because I have to <laughs> advance the slides, so I, I, I really want to do this and I want to walk around, but I'm going to be stuck here, so I, I'm hoping that's, that's okay. Well, let's get started here. Um, we know that smoking is uh, dangerous. Um, you don't have to be a 30-pack-a-day smoker to know that. Um, but here are some dramatic statistics about the global tobacco epidemic. About a quarter of men and about 5% of women smoke, and over 1 billion people smoke, and 80% of them are in low- and middle-income countries, LMICs. In the 20th century, there were 100 million deaths, but in the 21st century, this may go as high as 1 billion deaths. And so you have those low- and middle-income countries that are going to bear, be bearing the extraordinary majority of the brunt of the tobacco epidemic in this century. Um, it's every year, uh, well, a global uh, burden of, uh, of disease um, found that 6.4 million deaths, about a total, I guess, of about 7 million deaths uh, every year. Uh, it also, tobacco, especially smoking, of course, causes one-sixth of all non-communicable diseases worldwide, and it's really the only risk factor that causes all four leading uh, NCDs. So WHO has... Uh, indicated that tobacco is a leading preventable cause of death and disability in the world. It's not just a health problem, of course it's a societal problem, but it's also an economic problem. In fact, uh, from some of the work that we've done and some that uh, WHO has done, the total economic cost of smoking uh, is about $1.4 trillion a year, which is almost 2% of the world's GDP. And 40% of this cost is in developing countries. So again, with respect to the uh, inordinate burden on LMICs, uh, the uh, developing countries do not make up 40% of the world's GDP. So you can see how it's now disproportionate as far not only of its health uh, uh, effects, but also the economic impact. There are a couple of quotations that um, are very important and striking in thinking about tobacco. And this is the first one. Tobacco is the most effective agent of death ever developed and deployed on a worldwide scale. Note the words that are used here. Effective agent, developed, deployed. So you wouldn't say this about cholera. You wouldn't say this about polio. You wouldn't say this about um, uh, typhoid. But you say it about tobacco because this is a human-born uh, uh, illness, uh, plague, uh, and it's corporate-born. So given the size of the problem, the only real way to combat 
such a massive threat is by implementing population level interventions across entire populations. And to give you just a, a little bit of sense of what the potential is, uh, note here this curve, which is accumulative deaths from 1950 to 2050, estimated at 520 million deaths during that century period of time. So this is a cumulative curve, so it never goes down. But what we want to do is bend it downward, never going below its past uh, uh, data point, but bend it down so that at the end of that 100 years, we are not at 520 million deaths, we are at a lower level. So the impact of policies at the population level are to bend down that curve. And there are two factors that are related to this. The first one is the timing of the policy. All things being equal, the closer to the beginning point that the policy is implemented, the more that's going to have the potential to bend it down. So it's like physics, right? Um, you bend down a rod close to its origin, and then the end of it is going to be moved more than if you bend it in the middle or closer to the end of it. So that's the first one. The second one is all things being equal, the stronger the force that pushes it down, the more of an effect you will have on bending that down. So you uh, combine these two, and if you have a small effect uh, intervention, and it's played out, uh, and it's implemented rather late in the process, in the curve, you have less, you have not very much potential to bend down that curve. But if you have a strong intervention and you implement it earlier, then it has much stronger potential to bend down that curve. So in essence, this is what it all boils down to. Identify strong evidence-based measures that will reduce uh, tobacco cause harms, that is, push it down further, and implement these policies as soon as possible. We have the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Framework Convention is a fancy term for a UN treaty. Whenever you see convention, that means treaty, agreement between countries. This is a legally binding international treaty. It's the first ever under the WHO. WHO is a United Nations agency, and any United Nations agency could potentially uh, convene um, uh, a process for creating a treaty. This is the WHO's first. It wasn't about HIV AIDS, it wasn't about uh, malaria, it was about tobacco. It came into force in 2005, it's already been ratified by 180 countries and the European Union separately. So there are 181, quote, parties to the FCTC covering about 90% of the world's population. It's multi-sectoral, which means basically it says that it's a whole of government approach, it's not just a health issue, economic, development, commerce, trade, it's all wrapped up within the treaty. Um, and what's interesting about this uh, treaty, if you read the treaty text, um, a lot of treaties are very vague because they have to get agreement. This one's rather specific because if you look at the actual text of the treaty, it specifies a broad range of these tobacco control policies like pictorial warnings, comprehensive smoke-free laws, higher taxes to reduce demand, bans on marketing, support for cessation, tobacco product regulation. Uh, they're specified in pretty specific form, but then what happens after the treaty is adopted, then the conference of the parties, which meets every two years, consisting of the parties to the treaty, work, uh, move forward to develop guidelines, more detailed uh, expressions and uh, uh, descriptions of what the countries, the parties should be doing in order to fulfill that particular policy domain, articles, they're called. A very important um, uh, feature of the FCTC is tobacco industry must be prevented from influencing policies and measures. This is the number one obstacle to implementing the treaty. Well, not surprisingly, I think, although I don't believe it's been said in print, that the FCTC being uh, addressing the world's number one preventable cause of death and disease, and this uh, covering, uh, uh, obligating 90% of the world's population to adopt these strong measures, I think this is really very clearly the greatest disease prevention initiative uh, in history. But has the FCTC had an impact 
on driving down, let's say, smoking rates. Well, um, I was uh, fortunate enough to be a member of the seven-member impact assessment expert group that was charged from the Conference of the Parties to, uh, uh, to do an impact assessment of the treaty in its first 10 years. And uh, I won't go through all the details, but um, we uh, worked for about two years on this. And out of this came this article that um, uh, Shannon Gravely led, and Gary Giovino was an author, uh, I was, and some WHO colleagues were also uh, on this. And we did an analysis of WHO data from 126 countries. So basically what we did was we said, okay, the predictor variable is in that uh, 10 year period of time, first decade of the treaty, how many uh, of the measures, these key measures, uh, higher taxation, smoke-free laws, graphic warning labels, uh, ad bans, and support for cessation, those five, how many of those five did they implement? So you can see that's on the x-axis here. Then on the y-axis is that we also had WHO data on the prevalence and how it changed over that first decade. So you look at the relationship between the two and you say, oh, the more they did, the lower, the more the reduction in prevalence. You can see this. In fact, it's really strong. Each additional highest level implementation was associated with 1.57 percentage point decrease in smoking rates, a 7% relative decrease because not everyone smokes. That means that if, if a country went from zero to three, on average, they experienced a 21% relative reduction in their smoking rate. That's a huge effect. So the FCTC works if it is implemented at the highest level. So we've done some further calculations on exactly how many people might have been saved from smoking. Uh, that is, how many fewer smokers are there as a result of FCTC implementation. And what we found was that in the world, uh, the highest level implementation, those 126 countries, was associated with a reduction of 49 million smokers globally, which is a 4.8% reduction in the number of smokers throughout the world. But on average, a country implemented only one of the five key policies. And you can see that by going back to this curve and looking here, and 55 countries implemented none of the five policies. One country, who will remain nameless, uh, but uh, you, you can read it there. One country actually went backwards, a score of minus one, because I think they had smoke-free laws and then they took it back. Um, so the, that's that group there. And then 45 countries implemented only one of the five policies. And then 20 countries implemented only two of the five policies. And there were only five countries that did more than that. So basically, very poor implementation of the FCTC. So if, uh, so we've done these further calculations. And if countries had implemented all five instead of just 1.04, what would it look like? And we calculated it, and of course this is association, not cause, but hey, it's a reasonable model. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's a point estimate. We believe that uh, the world would have seen 315 million fewer smokers, a 31% reduction in smoking. So, very clear from this, stronger and more accelerated implementation of this treaty can lead to tremendous gains in global health. Why has implementation been so slow, and in many, many cases at levels far below the standards set by FCTC article guidelines? Well, here's the second quotation that really captures uh, so, uh, something profoundly interesting and unique about tobacco, and it's this one. Tobacco use is unlike other threats to global health. Infectious diseases do not employ multinational public relations firms. There are no front groups to promote the spread of cholera. Mosquitoes have no lobbyists. Wonderful prose style. I mean, Zeltner is just great writing here. But it captures that which I mentioned before, that this is a corporate-born uh, uh, epidemic. And of course, the tobacco industry is the most profitable business. And so uh, Credit Suisse uh, did this uh, analysis uh, f uh, th uh, two or three years ago. If you invested $1 in a number of industries, railroad, mining, communication, whatever, uh, invested chemical, invested in 1900, what would its value be in 2010? 
So here's what they came up with. Uh, there are a whole bunch of things here. You can telecom, market, uh, mines, ships, textiles, steel, and so on. So just to give you a little benchmark in the stock market, it was a 10.1% uh, annual rate. And this is associated with $1 in 1900 would have been worth $38,255 in 2010. Okay. Now, you can see this curve here, and some of the uh, lines are higher than others. You can see that light blue one there that goes up there. Gee, you wonder what that one is. Well, why would I be mentioning this unless it was tobacco? <laughs> okay, so in tobacco, it was a 15.3% annual rate. So um, uh, remember, uh, as you've been learning about the magic of compounding, right? Okay, so that's just why all of you who are students should start putting things in your retirement account. <laughs> but um, I think uh, the distance from 1900 to 2010 is probably longer than you, uh, you have till retirement. But 110, that 15.3% annual rate every year parlays itself into $6.28 million. Now, how come it doesn't show up here? I mean, after all, oh, that's a curve. Oh, well, the reason why is that it's a logarithmic scale. And we don't spend our dollars, at least I don't, in logarithms. We do it in linear dollars. So I regraphed this and just said, oh, okay. So for the stock market, it's 38,255. Uh, oh, uh-oh, oh. <laughs> it doesn't work. Well, anyway, you have this long red bar that goes all the way up to 6.3 million. Yeah, so that's really the scale of it, extraordinary scale. That's how, uh, that's how profitable tobacco is. And in fact, Warren Buffett, before he found Bill Gates, uh, used to talk about tobacco and he said, oh, uh, cigarettes as an investment, uh, a penny to make, a dollar to sell, and it's addictive, right? Like the perfect investment. So, but for our purposes here, talking about evidence and, and research and science to drive policy, the horrible thing about this, of course, is that the tobacco industry has distorted science from the very start. They have created front groups to cast doubt on the evidence of harms of smoking and then of secondhand smoke, payment to neutral scientists for re results uh, directed research, entire research programs to generate fake bodies of evidence. And of course, doubt is our product uh, from uh, Naomi and Eric's uh, book on Merchants of Doubt. So, in public, the fight against the industry is bought, uh, fought on the battlefield of evidence. What evidence do we have that tobacco control uh, policies really do work? And what evidence do we have that addresses the industry's claims that policies won't work or, and or they will lead to negative impact? So these industry claims endlessly talk about how tobacco control would cripple economies, they would increase illicit trade, uh, policies won't work, or even they will boomerang. So they have a lot of resources for this, but we have science on our hands. I'm going to come back to some examples of this. In the second decade of the FCTC, the first decade was to uh, build the treaty, uh, through uh, increasing the number of parties and to develop the guidelines so parties knew how to implement the treaty. We, in the second decade, uh, it's a noticeable shift for efforts to strengthen and accelerate implementation of the treaty. And the treaty is ripe uh, and, and uh, listens to and depends on scientific evidence. In fact, in the foreword, it even says FCTC is an evidence-based treaty. And indeed, if you look at the text, evidence, the word evidence is mentioned five times, and scientific mentioned 13 times. Effective or effectiveness is mentioned 28 times in it. So as we look uh, at evidence gathering systems to move the FCTC and tobacco control forward, we ask, um, well, what are these, how are, what type of evidence is available? So there's a type of evidence from treaty monitoring, which is what are the parties doing in their implementation obligations. That is basically uh, going through and, oh, who's doing smoke-free laws? How strong are they on paper, right? So this is a textual analysis of legislation and regulations in tobacco control. And there are a whole bunch of these. There are required um, reports that countries, the parties to the FCTC, have to send to the Secretariat to say what they've been doing.
okay, keeping track of that. And they're also monitoring efforts by civil society as well. WHO has their own. Then there's surveillance. What is the prevalence of tobacco use uh, and of key tobacco relevant behaviors and other uh, relevant uh, measures for tobacco use. And there are a number of examples of this, like the Global Adult Tobacco Survey in 30 countries, and seven countries have administered the GATS twice. Uh, and then there's also a carve out 22 key questions from the larger, about 50 to 60 question uh, GATS, uh, 22 countries uh, known as the TQS that has been uh, implemented in 72 countries, and this is an effort to build in some key measures in the GATS into countries' own national surveillance systems. So that's a really important effort there. And then some countries have their own surveillance systems. But there are a number of questions that are not well addressed by these monitoring surveillance systems. For example, how effective are a country's current FCTC policies? When a new policy is introduced, is it more effective? So for example, when you go from text warnings to graphic warnings, do, is that effective? Does it increase knowledge? Does it increase um, a salience of the warnings? Does it increase quit intentions? Does it increase thoughts about quitting? What are the ingredients of effective policies? Why and how do policies have their impact? Not just whether they have an impact, how and why do they do so? Do graphic warnings work because of negative emotions? or because they trigger thoughts of uh, perceived risk, personal risk, assessment that one might say is more cognitive rather than affective emotional. How does this policy work? Are there negative consequences of these policies? Do graphic warning labels, for example, lead to avoidance or boomerang effects, which is often cited by the industry? Does the effectiveness of a policy vary between countries? So are graphic warning labels more or less effective or the same in effectiveness in Thailand as they are in Australia? Does effectiveness vary within a country? So we know that tobacco use uh, is, uh, uh, there's a, a strong uh, social disparities gradient to it. So uh, poor people in virtually every country now uh, are significantly more likely to use tobacco and to smoke. It used to be the case, or used to be thought, that in some countries it's really the high end, but virtually in almost every country now it's the opposite. It's the same pattern as in the United States. Lower income are more likely to smoke and, and use tobacco. So therefore, does, can policies help to reduce these health disparities in tobacco use? So a rigorous evaluation system, separate from a monitoring or a surveillance system can answer these questions and can provide evidence-based guidance for effective policy making. So when we go to evaluate policies, it's not possible to conduct uh, experiments, randomized controlled trials on policies. So you can't say like, okay, North and South Dakota, you get the graphic warning labels, but Minnesota does not. Um, you can't do that. And even if you could, there'd be all kinds of problems with it, uh, besides legal problems. But what you can do is you can do observational studies, non-experimental studies, um, to evaluate the impact of these policies in a variety of methods. So for example, multiple country comparisons, international studies, combined with common measures and measure, uh, methods and measures across the countries for comparability across these countries, and then cohort studies. Uh, uh, looking at the same individuals over time. So you have the longitudinal component to it. You can do pre-post matched with control groups to create um, natural experiments or in economic terms, difference in different studies. So that, that was the foundation for the ITC project that we started uh, 15 years ago in four countries, Canada, US, Australia, and the UK. But um, over time, we uh, expanded it greatly with the focus on low and middle income countries. Um, so we have now, I think about out of the 29 countries that we have now, I think about 15 of them or 16 of them are low and middle income countries. And we have uh, very high coverage uh, in the top 10 countries for smoking. We have China, India, US, Brazil, Bangladesh, Germany, and we just added Japan this year. That's six. Uh, seven of the top 10 country uh, smokers. So uh, we're uh, over half of the world's population um, uh, we're, we've done work in, uh, uh, and these countries have covered over two thirds of the world's uh, tobacco users. Uh, it's 
we have pictures like this in all <laughs> 29 countries. Um, here are just some of them in China, Zambia, Bhutan, eight European countries, and Kenya. We do field work in all sorts of different ways. Um, uh, used to be uh, telephone surveys. We do face-to-face. -face. We do web-based. Uh, we do a mixture of them, uh, basically in all possible uh, modalities, which actually is an interesting sort of methodological um, set of studies that we're trying to look at um, to examine whether we get different results depending on that. So our objectives are to conduct rigorous evaluation of FCTC policies. There are some examples there. To compare the impact of FCTC policies across countries. And also, we spend a lot of time, and I'm going to be showing you mostly the communication of these findings to policymakers, governments, advocates, and others to support stronger and swifter implementation of evidence-based policies and to build capacity for tobacco control research, especially in LMICs. We have a conceptual model. And so this, it really starts off with um, how do you think it works? So if policies have their impact, ultimately, on behavior. How does it do that? Well, we know from past research, some done by many esteemed scientists in this room, about the predictors of behavior, which are these kinds of beliefs and attitudes, perceived risk, perceived severity, intentions to quit, and so on. We know that there's a strong linkage there. When we were developing this idea of how do we measure policy impact, the first place to start is, well, what, what do you think is the first thing that happens when you have a graphic warning label? What's the first thing that happens when you have a smoke-free law? So we built in these, what we call proximal policy-specific variables, like, oh, salience should go up, perceived costs should go up if you increase taxes, et cetera, et cetera, here. So then we are trying to forge a link here. So we already have this link here. So now, if we can build a link there, then we have the whole chain from the policies to the behaviors. And so we built this model before we even had a survey. Um, and we have moderators that say that, oh, well, maybe each of these links might depend on SES or, or ethnicity. It might depend on you know, whether you're highly dependent on, on, on uh, nicotine. It might depend on a uh, time perspective, personality differences, short-term versus long-term thinking, stress, depression, a proximal social environment, cigarette smoking by friends, and you know, whether your spouse smokes, and so on. So all those can, be, can moderate the links between these individual stages. And this model also says that, oh, there's public health impact, and there could be economic impact. There could be economic, uh, there could be uh, effects, behavioral effects that don't lead to any public health impact, like when uh, prices increase and people switch to a lower uh, price brand instead of quitting. Well, you have a change in behavior, but it has no public health implication uh, there. So this is the whole model, and this is the model that drove the development of all of the survey items uh, in the ITC project. So you can see this is not your, <laughs> your average surveillance system. It has a causal model associated with it to get at the how and why. So I guess that's from my background in psychology. I just naturally think in terms of well, what's going to affect what and what's going to affect that. And you meld that within a, you know epidemiological framework with a strong design, a cohort design with multiple countries. And then you've got a evaluation system that can be maximally uh, 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 created um, to give you a strong evaluation data uh, of use to uh, policymakers. Anyway, so this is the, the PATH model, uh, which is the conceptual model for uh, effects there. And it has a curious uh, similarity uh, uh, between that and the ITC model. Well, that's because I wrote this. So. Um, Andy is the, uh, uh, the scientific uh, principal investigator for the PATH project, so we worked together and, and ITC was a part of the, especially at the, at the beginning of the design of the PATH model. Um, so the, the content of the survey, I'm not going to go into this, but the really the, it's 150, over 150 questions focusing on policy impact. And we are very flexible. We actually change our survey over time across countries, across waves, to meet the new, uh, you know, new advances or new changes, rather, 
not necessarily advances in the policy environment and now currently in the product environment with respect to e-cigarettes and perhaps on the on the uh, horizon heated tobacco products. So it's uh, we spent a huge amount of time trying to figure out the confirmation of this the next. Uh, survey in this country that will achieve not only the goals of being, you know, changing and evolving depending on the policy environment, but also uh, comparability across the others. It's 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 a real. Uh, a problem. We have a mediational model, model policy effects that says that labels work differently than ad bans, and uh, you know they can be described by the same general model. But we have measures of all of these things, so we can look at how labels work, how ad bans work, how smoke-free laws work, and so on. Not only in the ultimate outcomes on behavior, but also along the way. Are people changing their views of smoking in public? Are they changing their views of what, you know, their personal threat and risk of tobacco-related or smoking-related diseases? So we have all that. We have also tested some of these uh, mediational models there. So let me get into a little bit of uh, some of our findings here. The first one is graphic health warnings. And Canada was the first country to introduce uh, pictorial warnings in January 2001. And since that time, there, there are now 116 countries that now require pictorial warnings. Uh, there are 107 countries that require warnings that cover at least 50% of the front and back of the pack. And whoops, United States tied for last place. <laughs> yes, right, that's right. Um, and of course, uh, even though they're obligated to do so, and we'll see with respect to FDA whether they can come up with a second attempt to uh, 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 form a rule for graphic warning labels and so on. So we have a number of measures uh, in our survey on effectiveness uh, for health warnings. Uh, noticing warnings, uh, it's based kind of on a communication model. Notice warnings, closely read model uh, warnings. Uh, how much the warnings make you think about the health risks of smoking? How much you make, uh, does it make you more likely to quit? Have you made any effort to avoid the warnings? Which actually is, if anything, positively related to outcomes. People used to ask me, oh, um, the graphic warning labels, but people are like taking out their cigarettes and putting them in, you know, in, a, you know, in a, their own case so they don't get to see them. I said, well, let them do it because they know what they're doing. I mean, you're spending all that time and effort. Wow, you're really engaged in those warnings there. So it turns out that actually in some of our studies, that type of avoidance is significantly positively related to stronger quit intentions. So let them do it. Um, uh, and then um, anyway, so these measures have been responsive to health changes in health warnings in many countries. And let me show you some examples of this. Australia went from text to, uh, to graphic in March of 2006. Uh, and those are the graphics that were introduced in Australia, uh, and that's the 90% of the back. And then this is, <laughs> you don't even need to know where the warnings were, uh, uh, graphic warning labels were introduced because you just see this curve, you go, wow, something really happened between wave four and wave five. That's where the graphics were uh, introduced there. Now we have, in most countries, we have population uh, representativeness. So we can take those effect sizes and we can multiply them by the number of smokers uh, in the country to achieve this. Uh, we, the, here's the effect size. Noticing 43% went up to 72%, increased to 29%. And not smoking a cigarette um, because of the warnings before, 10%. And not smoking uh, uh, a cigarette uh, at least once um, after the graphic warning labels, 21%, increase of 11% you can multiply those by the number of smokers in Australia. In other words, after the introduction of pictorial warnings, 870,000 more smokers noticed the warning, 330,000 more smokers reported not smoking a cigarette because of the warnings. Mauritius, the tiny island country, it's off the coast of Madagascar, which itself is an island off the coast of Africa. Uh, so uh, it's actually a very famous country for doing a lot with NCD. Uh, prevention. So this is what happens when they went from text to a graphic, huge effects on all our indicators. And we've also done work in um, uh, challenging FDA in their assessment of the impact of graphic warning labels in the United States. They claim that the uh, uh, FDA claimed in their analysis, uh, looking at Canada and what happened in Canada, that there would be only a 0.088% 
uh, percentage point reduction. So of course, the judge in DC circuit uh, uh, said, well, gee, I mean, if you're only dealing with that, like, that's not worth it, basically. Well, he said a lot of other things, but. Um, but we actually did a reanalysis based on ITC data, too complicated to go into, but we actually said, hey, actually playing by FDA's rules, but using ITC data, uh, it's actually 2.87 to 4.68 percentage points. So uh, as um, they get their uh, FDA formulates a new rule, another second attempt for graphic warning labels, maybe this will uh, come up. We have spent a lot of time in China on the need for a stronger implementation of policies. And this is something about China. 300 million smokers, over half of men smoke. Uh, only 2.5% of women smoke. About a million smokers die a year. That will more than double in the next, actually, 10 years. So what does this mean? We know that up to 2 thirds of regular smokers die of smoking at an average loss of life of over 10 years. So, there's very little quitting in China. The quit rates are very low. So basically, anyone who's a smoker now is really a long-term smoker. So two -thirds, up to two-thirds of them are going to die. So if you take half of men, and uh, over half of men, and you multiply by two-thirds, that's more than one-third of all men. So what does that mean? I spent a lot of time in China. Uh, over one-third will die from smoking, losing over a decade of life, and you, China's crowded. So here's a, a picture I took of the subway. And you count up the men, and every third man that you see is going to be dead. Loss of life over a decade. And basically, it's like that. You know, walking down the street, Shanghai, Beijing, Xi'an, every third man, you know, one, two, oh, that one, and so on. That's what it's equivalent to. A massive, horrible problem. It's also a horrible problem because the tobacco industry is owned by the, the state. It's a state-owned enterprise. CNTC, it makes 44% of all cigarettes in the world. They are killing their people, and it's an economic issue because actually taxes and uh, profits uh, end up being somewhere between 7 and 10% of the economy of China. So for a number of years, we have done an extensive survey in China cohort survey in China, uh, uh, now also in rural areas as well as urban areas like Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Guangzhou. And we've done a lot of uh, work on this, uh, showing and trying to name and shame uh, what's going on in China with their poor performance in tobacco control. So here's one example of it. In 2008, China and Malaysia had the same text, poor text-only warnings, on side of the pack and text-only. So that's China, and that's Malaysia. Hmm, do they look familiar to you? No, not because of the language, but because of the position and size. This is the US model, right now, on the PACs, on the side, and text only. But in 2009, China stayed text only, and there's the warning label there, 30%. And Malaysia went graphic, and so there's an example of the graphic that was introduced. So it's like the perfect, Natural experiment. They started off at the same place, and then they went their separate ways. So what happened in Malaysia compared to in China? Well, first in China. Oh, you, you move the text warning to the front of it? Yeah, you get a little bit of increment there, right? And it's statistically significant because we've got 8,000 people in China. So, but only noticing was only 2.8% increase, and foregoing a cigarette, only 5% increase. So it does a little something, and etc. But in Malaysia, 40% front, 60% back, it went up a lot there. And noticing went up by 16% and not smoking because of the, uh, because the warnings went up by 33%. So you can multiply that by the number of uh, smokers in Malaysia. But now, uh, if China, so this is the lost opportunity. So you take the difference uh, like 15.8% noticing in Malaysia, uh, minus 2.8, that's 13% net. So that's the lost opportunity, right? So, times 300 million, 
28 million more smokers would have noticed the warnings often. 25 million would have read the warnings more often, et cetera, et cetera. Here, incredible numbers uh, in China here because of the lost opportunity for not going graphic. All right. We've done a lot with you know, WHO and other kinds of uh, groups uh, in China to bring this out. Here we've uh, done a lot of reports. We've talked to the Communist Party, uh, the Chinese Communist Party School. Um, so it's not party school, as in like maybe Penn State. <laughs> um, it's Communist Party School uh, because it's the think tank for uh, governmental officials that uh, want to. So whenever someone goes to a uh, government official goes to to the uh, Communist Party school, you know they're going to get a promotion. So anyway, we've worked with them. We've worked with uh, a number of leaders. We've worked with uh, uh, the H New Health Commission itself, a China CDC, all trying to you know, get awareness and uh, get them to change. Uh, we've done smoke free here. Here's an example where in China, uh, over time, smoking in restaurants has gone down some. But look at ITC. These are all ITC data. What happened when Ireland, the first country uh, to go smoke free uh, in restaurants, uh, smoking 84% to 2%, 1%. Scotland went from 60 to 1. France, where they said, oh, it's never going to work here, Simone de Beauvoir and you know, whatever, right? In the cafes and so on. It'll never work here. Oh, of course it'll work. It worked. Uh, Germany, uh, Germany uh, state level uh, laws rather than truly national laws, Netherlands, Mexico City versus Mexico, really interesting because Mexico City has a stronger law than Mexico. You've got a, like a great dose response effect within the same country. Uh, and the Mauritius, and then here's Beijing, when they were the first city to actually go smoke free. So you can see that compared to the slow drip uh, in, in prevalence in restaurants there. And Korea, there's newer data there, that's also gone down. So support, we also gather support data, you know, uh, and these are of smokers. And the great thing about this is that um, support, this is among smokers for the smoke-free law in uh, bars. Uh, Ireland went from 12% and then after the law, 48%, 61% of smokers like the uh, smoke-free law in bars, in pubs. And you can see it always goes up. But note the levels just before, right? And look at China now. It's already much higher. So the government has said, ooh, there's going to be civil unrest, the, you know, the tear down of the you know, social fabric if we go smoke free. It's like, come on, 35% versus 12% in Ireland? So there's a lot more, so we try to name and shame in that way. So we've also uh, uh, done some research that shows policy works without adverse side effects. And this is, uh, you know, again, the Ireland reported uh, smoking in bars and pubs is like 99, 98% to 2%. It's like, you will, I will never do another study in which the effects are from the ceiling to the floor. I mean, it just, you just never get that, right? It's barely, oh, 0 0.05, if we tweak, tweak it a little bit, you know, out of 4,000, it's like, you don't even have, you can, you can gather like five people and do a sign test, uh, and you'll get significance. So, and then support went up significantly. So then, uh, there was a massive cultural shift in Ireland, and here's a nice cartoon. I can tell you've been in the pub, there's no smell of smoke off your clothes. Um, but then there was resistance, and this is John Reid, the former UK Secretary of State for Health, because Scotland was going to go smoke-free after Ireland, but then why not England? And so this guy was brought in on the carpet to say, why aren't you doing this in England when Scotland's going ahead? Well, a little secret here, John Reid, three years before this, he's the Secretary of State for Health in, in England. Three years before, he was Forrest, the Smokers' Rights Group in England, Smoker of the Year. So how did he get to that position? I don't know. But then again, I live in Ontario, and then two decades ago, there was an education minister that never graduated from high school. So I don't know how this all happens. But he said this. He, he explained why he wasn't going to go for smoke-free in England, even though in Scotland they are. And that he said, oh, in Scotland they've decided to go for a complete ban on smoking. I came to the conclusion that that was not a good thing on health grounds. Huh? You're not going for a complete ban on smoking on health grounds? What? Apart from anything else, because you get a displacement of smoking from some public areas to the home. 
wow, that's really clever, right? Because you can sort of imagine uh, a scenario which, yeah, that there might be a ring of truth to it, right? Um, what we do know, for instance, in, uh, in Ireland, and we would anticipate in Scotland, is that a percentage of people who previously went to the pub to smoke will now get a carryout and take it home. I think the percentage in Ireland is about 15%. Okay, now he's just making up data. <laughs> so, um, because there were no data, except we had data. Because we found out that there was a significantly greater likelihood that a smoker, after the ban in Ireland, would make their own home smoke-free. Significant. So that was part of our 2006 article. So, so I presented this uh, at a, a high-level meeting in Luxembourg, both the Ireland uh, data and also this displacement, um, uh, you know, fallacy, and um, that may have been instrumental in, in spreading. I don't know. Yeah. See, policymakers never tell you. Yeah. You know, it was that your study. No, they don't do that because. They say, yeah, it was our brilliance in policy. <laughs> right, I mean, it's just, yeah, you know, they're never going to admit it. But it was in, let's put it this way, the ITC data were in the mix. So we have also tried to bring our data to governments in many ways uh, through, uh, directly through submissions, graphic warning labels in the US, plain packaging, Uruguay, Canada, uh, plain packaging, and uh, Hong Kong, uh, larger warnings. And we also uh, do direct testimony. So um, a few years ago, Health Canada said that, oh, we've been working on revising the warning labels for three years now. Oh, we're no longer going to do that. We're going to do social media instead. And the first reaction was, that's ridiculous. Second of all, it's like, you can do both. So uh, a number of us got really upset, and I testified in the House of Commons Health Committee on the government's decision to shelf this revision. And I presented these data showing we're out of the warnings in Canada over seven years. You got to do something about this here. So you know, who knows what happened? but probably more the advocates than me. But um, three weeks later, she said, oh yeah, we, we were never gonna not revise the warnings. And so these are the warnings that are now on, now on the PACs. So they went through that. And not only that, but see, we have a Canada survey, so we actually uh, evaluated what happens when you actually do that, and it pops back up. So we also do uh, research guiding policymakers not to do the wrong thing. So in Ken uh, I have two examples of this in Kenya. Um, it's a bit complicated, but let's put it this way. In some countries, they have what is known as a tiered tax structure for cigarettes or for tobacco products. So that is that the uh, premium cigarettes are taxed at a different rate than the, than the regulars, than the discounts. Well, what happens there is that you get more greater variability of prices. And so when a tax increase comes, people can downshift. They can escape the higher prices because they can go there. And, and a tiered structure is bad at this because it accentuates that natural tendency. Okay, So uh, Kenya used to be uh, a, a tiered tax structure. And then for a few years, it became a flat structure where everything's taxed the same. And a specific tax in there, which means, anyway. Um, <laughs> I won't go into the details. But so the Kenyan parliament proposed, because they were influenced by the industry, proposed to return to a tax, a tiered tax structure. The president was advised to stay with you know, the untiered structure. What we did was we did a, a report there that we sent to the president and sent to the media and all that stuff. We sent a letter to the president, and the president prevailed in this. And we also had all this, look, look what you're missing with respect to you know, revenue and also with respect to prevalence because it also helps your revenue when you have more efficient tax structure. Anyway, so, so that was an example how we use ITC data in this. This is all from ITC uh, data. And just uh, a few weeks ago, I was at COP8, the eighth conference of the parties, where the 181 parties uh, get together to move forward the treaty. And uh, they were considering uh, the horrors of, it's a bit complicated, but emissions testing. Um, uh, as, as Lynn uh, Kozlowski is globally famous for, um, knowing the, 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 the huge problems of emissions testing, uh, uh, and uh, it's, uh, those ISO, those TAR ratings, are not reflective of what humans actually take in. And yet, there has been uh, uh, ongoing efforts in WHO, uh, and WHO, what's known as Tobacco Laboratory Network, uh, to try to get 
um, these uh, standard operating procedures, including uh, emissions testing back in as, uh, as standards. So, um, won't go into this, but basically we uh, lobbied, um, and I lobbied like the, the chair who's from Korea. Actually, it's very nice lobbying because, because this guy's on our ITC Korea uh, uh, project team. And so we had a number of other people, that's the Malaysia person, and we know, our, that's Ariana, who's head of tobacco control, and she's part of our ITC project. And anyway, there were a whole bunch of people in the room that, that sort of I, I talked to about this, and so it ended up that, um, anyway, that they did not a full uh, widespread uh, uh, adoption of these emission standards. So it's gonna be a continuing uh, struggle here. Um, so we've also used uh, ITC data to defend against tobacco industry challenges. i give you two examples, one's from the Uruguay Bilateral Investment Treaty and the other one is Australia, the WTO. Aust uh, Uruguay increased their warning size from 50% to 80% and PMI, Philip Morris International said, ah, you can't do that because it infringes on our uh, uh, bilateral investment treaty between Switzerland and Uruguay. That's right, I mean under most bilateral investment treaties, um, what happens is that a corporation in one country can sue a government of another, a sovereign state of another, in, because, oh, you're, you're messing with our profits. You better have a good reason for it. So they challenged Uruguay uh, PMI because PMI is located in Lausanne, Switzerland. And so they said, you're damaging our brand, we want money. Um, so an example of this, uh, and so here's uh, John Oliver that, um, talks about this. Uruguay started introducing increasingly larger health warnings. Smoking rates dropped and Uruguayans like them, of course, with 68% of so smokers... So he's citing ITC data there. But just because they wanted it hasn't stopped PMI from suing them for the past five years. Yeah. So uh, the whole point was, does the uh, warning labels, do they get more effective when you go from 50% to 80%? So that was their claim. Like, if it doesn't work, well, why would you have it? You know, then, then we win. Oh, it turns out we had uh, cohort data from Uruguay over a number of waves, and here's what happens when you increase size from 50% to 80%. All significant increases. So we presented this at the tribunal, and they had no response for this. So it works. So they got crushed. So another example is uh, plain packaging, which is basically the graphic warning label stays on the pack, but all the branding is, in this dis uh, is removed and replaced by this plain packaging of this disgusting uh, color, uh, you know, Pantone 483C or whatever it is. I mean, it is, I mean, they've done, oh, elaborate studies. All these countries have done elaborate. What is the ugliest color you can imagine? And so they actually experimentally test this. So that's the ugliest. 483C uh, Pantone. Um, so anyway, so the industry went after plain packaging because look, with uh, ad, uh, ad advertising promotion being banned and you know billboards and you know uh, florid advertising and a lot of times point of sale, um, package is always really important. It's a badge product, right? As been noted many times, you carry around your image of yourself. It's advertising. It's walking billboard, right? So plain packaging removes that at least the packaging in that part. So there have been a number of legal challenges here. They won uh, the constitutional challenge, bilateral investment treaty, uh, Philip Morris Asia and Hong Kong challenged, uh, Hong Kong, uh, challenged uh, Australia uh, via the Aus Hong Kong Australia bilateral investment treaty. And then the most sub substantial one, which is at the WTO, there was a challenge by four countries, it used to be five, it was Ukraine, uh, and uh, f over 40 countries. So this is the largest ever uh, WTO uh, dispute. So here's John Oliver talking about this. This is Ukraine, the story of Ukraine. You will never guess who else is coming after Australia. Three governments, Honduras, the Dominican Republic, and Ukraine have filed complaints with the World Trade Organization against Australia's plain packaging laws. That's right, Ukraine is charging Australia with hurting its tobacco export, something which was a bit of a surprise to a Ukrainian member of Parliament. Well, first of all, about the position of the government, uh, it seems to be a joke, because we have a zero trade exchange between Australia and Ukraine in tobacco years. Zero trade! <laughs> zero! 
So Ukraine is inserting themselves into something they have nothing to do with. Okay. So anyway, um, uh, we have some ITC evidence there. We uh, wrote this report uh, with the British Heart Foundation that was read into the uh, UK House of uh, Lords. When they, when they were putting together their own uh, plain packaging standards, uh, I and uh, two other uh, ITC members were uh, part of the uh, WTO defense team for Australia there and uh, uh, WTO, uh, Australia won. So you can read the 888 pages, you probably don't want to. Uh, but they actually did a lot on looking at the facts and looking at our reports and looking at the evidence for plain packaging. So I'm not gonna, uh, I, I only have a couple more minutes here, but I wanted to say that the ITC project is more than just the surveys. We do experimental studies. We do tobacco product uh, analysis and Rich O'Connor at Roswell and Mache Ganovich are, are heading uh, our uh, ITC uh, tobacco uh, product project there we've done a whole bunch of studies comparing uh, not only the surveys but also contents of cigarettes and so our heavy metals uh, uh, paper got a lot of uh, airplay uh, showing that Chinese cigarettes have three times the, uh, the levels of uh, lead, cadmium and arsenic uh, compared to Canadian cigarettes. We're also doing a lot of work now of course on new products here. Uh, these are the heated tobacco products that uh, you really can't uh, see here yet. There's a lot of, uh, you know, what's the best regulatory approach for these here, endless. We're doing a lot of work uh, on this right now. We have a model that examines the relationship between cigarettes, dual use, uh, uh, vaporized nicotine, uh, nic Nicotine vape, vape, vaping, <laughs> I can't remember what our new term is for it. Anyway, but you, you get the idea, the uh, vaping products and the neither, and how, what's really fascinating about this is that for cigarettes, it's really easy because there's nothing good about it, so they all push people away from cigarettes. However, VNP policies, regulations, some of them push away, right, like smoke-free laws, uh, vaping is included, but maybe pull toward maybe differential taxation. So we're examining the relationship between policies and regulations. So I'm not gonna uh, do this anymore. There's an extraordinary change in the nicotine market. Uh, the heated tobacco products, we've never seen anything like this. 30% decline in cigarette sales as reported by Japan Tobacco uh, in Japan uh, in two years. We know it's true because they're losing it to PMI's ICOS. Anyways, we're doing work in Japan. We're doing also a biomarker study in Japan and Canada to try to look at, at these. Um, so conclusions. Population level interventions are essential for tackling the global tobacco epidemic. And as we've seen, the FCTC works if it's implemented strongly, but implementation has been slow because of industry. And now there's a shift a dramatic, pretty dramatic shift in the Conference of the Parties from building the treaty to implementing it. Evidence from evaluation studies are absolutely essential to uh, accelerate and strengthen efforts because this is at the policy level. So implementation is policy. So uh, ITC uh, conceptual framework and methods are applicable to other domains where population level interventions are being implemented. And this is something we wrote in, the, in our handbook. Just as surely as the laws of gravity operate in Mumbai as they do in Lyon. I know, I was getting a little bit uh, purple prose. Uh, the principles of causality and the methods employed to make more confident judgments about causality are constrained by neither location nor content domain. So the kind of uh, strategy that we've used in tobacco could easily be done, let's say, for alcohol control. And here's an example of 13 countries uh, in New Zealand. Uh, from a group in New Zealand looking at this. And uh, they wanted us, they wanted to use our logo. I said, no, we'll, we'll design your own for you that has that similarity there. Anyway, so that's all I have to say. I welcome questions or comments, and thank you very much. It's been a privilege. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Fong, for a very interesting and stimulating discussion. We do have time for a few questions. Um, I'm always intrigued by why the U.S. is at the bottom, <laughs> but there may be other questions. Um, okay. Uh, Jeff, thank you for a fantastic talk and um, for designing what to me is the most comprehensive public health surveillance 
uh, uh, policy evaluation program in the world, without question. Um, so you've demonstrated clearly the power of data. You also demonstrated that the countries aren't implementing the policies as well as they might. No. What's your sense of where we'll be 10 years from now, if the average is 1.05 or whatever it is now? What do you think it'll be like um, after 20 years? Oh, well, that's a really great question, and it depends on the extent to which there can be measures placed so that the industry doesn't continue to dominate. And it's very depressing because they've got far more resources at their disposal, and they can just kind of wait it out. I mean, and so I am not that optimistic, actually. I think what we need to do is we need to stay on it, and I think people themselves and policymakers need to be apprised as on how the industry actually does their work, their lobbying. And in fact, there's a new uh, initiative called STOP that uh, Anna Gilmore at University of Bath uh, and uh, a number of uh, Bloomberg uh, 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 philanthropies uh, funded um, groups are, are collaborating on to really bring out uh, the, the news on, on how the industry actually does its dirty work. That's the best we can do to highlight it because at the end they've got both explicit uh, methods of influence like bribery, uh, I mean literally, uh, or indirect bribery, like there's some, you know, a lot of countries in Europe, uh, gee, the policymakers, their, their sons and daughters are going to med school in, you know, in the UK. Anyway, uh, there, are, there are a lot of stories and so on, some of them documented, some of them not so documented, but we need to bring that out. It's all about Article 5.3, which is the industry should have no role in defining policy. That, uh, depending on how we deal with that, that's going to be the, uh, the key to whether we see great improvement or not so much improvement in the next 10 years. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, you, you did an incredible uh, demonstration of showing how uh, you were able to uh, use your organization to translate the data to uh, advocacy and also for defense of mm -hmm. uh, these policies, uh, and perhaps uh, you and others uh, in the university could answer if they're also including the idea of uh, defending these policies in the education of uh, public health. Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm sitting here wondering uh, where's the next generation of, of what you're doing? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, are, it, it, what do you know? If you've seen other courses, or what are they talking about here at this school? I don't know what you're talking about at this school. Um, I do know that um, it is an issue. I mean, some of us have been talking about, like, what is the next generation interested in? Can we do this? I mean, the ITC project has been funded by only research grants, basically. Uh, we don't have money from Gates. We don't have money from Bloomberg at all. Um, and it's a struggle uh, to keep up this, you know, this project that reaches over half of the world's population. Um, I, there's just, you know, and it's just getting harder and harder. So really we need um, more, um, you know, students and, and people to, to really take an interest in, in what we can do to really move forward on this number one preventable cause of death and disease. Um, yeah. uh, and just to comment a little bit, first, we really do need next generation people. I mean, there, I'm one of the older guys and there are mid-level uh, people now uh, but there will be a meeting at 2.30 today for students, Lena Mu with the Global Health Initiative, at 1.30 today, I'm sorry. Um, Lena Mu uh, invited any students who are interested in getting involved in international uh, tobacco control work to, to speak with Jeff. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that this work continue because you've shown the power of data and it's it's something that we have that can counter them. You know, yep. the way, I forget the example you gave, oh, it was Uruguay. He yep. said they had nothing. Yep. And all of a sudden, data settled the policy yep. argument, so. If you are interested, um, that meeting with Dr. Fong takes place at 1.30 in Kimball 430. Um, and he will be there for about an hour to talk to students or faculty who are interested. 
At this point, um, it is my pleasure to present on behalf of the school oh. a thank you thank to you. Dr. Fong for uh, serving as our Perry lecturer this year. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.